I told Chris that uh, it was much more frightening to come on stage with him than to appear in the Court of Appeal. And, and Chris's response was, you're welcome. <laughs> so we'll see, we'll see where this takes us. Um, the washroom, as you figured out, is straight down there, and those are sort of the safety issues. Uh, for those of you who uh, are not familiar with Chris, and there may be someone here, uh, Chris Cran is one of the most, of Canada's most celebrated painters. In Alberta and Calgary, Chris is everywhere. His nickname sometimes is the Godfather. <laughs> Besides being perhaps our most famous painter, he's been actively involved in Calgary's internationally acclaimed one Yellow Rabbit Performance Theater. He's on the advisory board of the artist-run Stride Gallery. He's a board member of Contemporary Calgary. He's been a teacher at the Alberta College of Art and Design. And what I really think has been his gift, he's been a mentor and a magnanimous supporter of up-and-coming artists in his hometown. If you go to a gallery opening, you see Chris, and, um, and he's so darn supportive. And of course, to his six kids, he's just dad. <laughs> his uh, National Gallery of, of Canada survey exhibition, Sincerely Yours, in Ottawa last year, was very well received. Um, this is a catalog, and if any of you want to um, get the catalog afterwards, just let us know. And, um, and if you love Chris as much as I do, and I, I like his work as well, um, <laughs> you'll want to get that. Uh, Chris's work can be found in numerous private and public collections, including, of course, the National Gallery, the Glenbow, the Nickel, the Art Gallery of Alberta, and of course, as you've noticed coming in, he's in the collection of Gibraltar Place, which is the prestigious office building on 9th Street and 9th Avenue in Calgary. <laughs> <laughs> Home of pool lawyers. Uh, Yves Trepanier from Trepanier Bear has been his long time and very supportive dealer. He's also uh, represented by Clint Ronish in, in uh, Toronto and Wilding Cran in Los Angeles. I'm so pleased to sit down and talk with Chris. Uh, please give Chris a fine welcome. Thank you. And thank you for coming. This, uh, this is a real privilege. Uh, we spent uh, three hours yesterday in which we uh, managed to cull the slides down and now they've been culled up. So uh, <laughs> let, me, l let, me, let me just suggest, tell you what, what we have in mind. Uh, Chris has an incredible body of work and some people have said that when you go to one Chris Cran show, uh, retrospective anyway, you can see the work of many artists. I'm persuaded that that's not true. I'm persuaded that the curious and talented uh, Chris Cran has followed uh, his own path, uh, and his own path has been one of curiosity and intrigue. I want, uh, what we see tonight as a journey down uh, the path of Chris Cran from some places where he began to now. Uh, Chris, I'll let you begin with our first uh, piece. First piece, My Face in Your Home, which kind of says it all. Uh, this is actually, uh, I reworked a uh, Apple Box uh, label, fr probably from the 40s, and uh, just placed my, my face in there and your modest home. <laughs> and uh, here's another painting. Uh, this is a painting called Self-Portrait uh, Self Accepting a Check for the Commission of this Painting. 
uh, it's uh, six six feet by eight feet in the this is in the mid 80s and um, uh, there are a lot of stories involved with uh, the person who's handing me the the check but this is Peter Boyd who just passed away on Friday so uh, very close friend for all those years um, he did tell me one story though that was uh, when he, this painting arrived in Toronto uh, and he hung it in his family home, it was, uh, it was on a wall that faced the curtains that faced the street. And he said people stopped all the time and looked <laughs> there. And in fact, he had somebody come, came to the door one time, knocked on the door and just asked him what the hell was going on there. <laughs> Here's a picture taken with Peter and I at the Art Gallery of Alberta. Uh, in, in 2016. And here's a painting called Family. This is what my, my uh, three of my children who are, happened to be with me at the time. And uh, it's based on, a, it's a social realist paintings from China, from Russia, from America in the 20s and 30s where people would pose and um, they would be looking off to the upper left, off to the future. And so I invented this, the, this uh, image of my, my family as if we were a cult. We were the followers of, were the followers of Nostradamus. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you see, whatever, it, whatever uh, I'm into, I'm really into it. And, my son, pretty much. My daughter, a bit less, and the youngest one. It looks like it's just hurting his nose. So, so Chris, Chris, one of the interesting things, there they are. <laughs> As adults, yes. One of the interesting things about the cult of Nostral... Nostral, uh, Nostral Domus. Nostral Domus is it had two essential rules of engagement, as I understand. Uh, which were... <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. We, we had, we had uh, two, two imp really important slogans. Um, one was, uh, an open nose means an open mind. And the other one was, our noses are open to the world. <laughs> Those are the two rules that I think uh, you need no more. say it all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was a oh, still a series of self-portraits that were done in the 80s. This is pr probably one of the last ones. Andy Warhol died. And he wasn't about to paint my portrait, so I decided to make a painting of him, uh, a painting as if he'd done my portrait. So this is port, uh, four portraits of the artist by Andy Warhol. <laughs> now, if you, what you're seeing there is uh, a painting hanging on a wall. Uh, I'll, I'll tell this story because Eve is Eve Trapani is here. When he came to see this, he came to see the painting. He. Um, he said, oh, this just looks like a Warhol ripoff. And, uh, and he brought a photographer with him, and he came with his wife, and they, they were there for about 10 minutes. The photographer set his camera up to take a picture of the yellow painting. And after they were there for 10 minutes, Eve, or sorry, the, the, uh, Eve's wife said, um, well, you know the painting is actually the big white rectangle. So the, sh the painted shadow under the yellow painting fooled him, fooled the photographer, and I just made 10 more of them. <laughs> well, one of the things I was interested in when we were chatting, Chris, was you were telling me how you got into realism in the first place because realism, when you decided to do it, was unpopular. It was. And uh, what happened was before I went to art college, I had a friend in British Columbia named Steve Many, who was a realist painter, and he showed me some techniques of uh, realist techniques, how to paint. And I began doing, uh, I had six kids going through art college, and so I began doing uh, portrait commissions to make a living. And after doing them, you know, I got pretty tired of doing them because it's always subordinate to what the, the person who's, what they look like. And uh, so at some point I thought, well, I've developed this technique, what can I do with it? And realists, there were some great realists around, uh, John Hall being one of them. And, and, uh, but I started doing these self-portraits. So that's kind of, it got rolling. And then at some stage, the self-portraits gave way to 
something new for you. Something new. Well, at the end of the 80s, I, did, I had a show of the self-portraits called Love by Millions in, at the Art Gallery of Windsor. And I, I figured that was about the end of the self-portraits because I, I remember going to, to uh, uh, parties and openings and people would talk to me like I was the character in, this, in these paintings. <laughs> so I thought, I'm going to try something else. <laughs> and I did, which was uh, I made paintings that instead of being done taking two to five months to do, had to be finished in a day. So it was at the end of the day, it was like opening a Christmas present to myself. <laughs> and so that would be, so here are some of these, the paintings from this period. Uh, and this particular painting is called Red Man Black Cartoon, which has been used for a lot of the posters and things that, for my, the various shows. Um, somebody, I heard somebody say once that the mind can't entertain two things at the same time. And I was really interested in this idea of delivering two things at the same time. So the mind or the eye that's observing it travels between one thing and the other. So if you look at just the cartoon uh, version, you see if you can see a face. But then if you look be behind it, there's a, an eye peering out and a slight smile. So that's, there's that traveling. And here's another one, if the button will work. There we are. So it's a bit small, but there's a, this one's also like a face with the, uh, a still life behind it. Oh, and then I moved to these paintings, which were, um, I was using photographic sources. So what I did is I went to a, I went to a, uh, let me just see here if I've gone too far. Okay. These are some uh, lar very large paintings, uh, nine feet by six feet portraits. The originals were about an inch tall. And I took a macro lens in, into, a, into a pulp magazine and found these portraits and, uh, and photographed them. And they're, they're made of dots. So the halftone dots are the, how any image on an, an old newspaper or a newspaper is made. Dots and... Uh, it's either black or white, and the gray just appears to be there by virtue of the size of the dots. So here's uh, another one. This is a hand with uh, um, done with the halftone dots and stripes. I'm putting stripes over the whole thing, so they're not actually not putting them over. I'll just tell you, I put so this in this case, I put down a white ground, and then I put tape down, evenly spaced. And then put and then painted over top of that. I painted the uh, the black dots and then pulled the tape off, which exposed the white lines. And then the next step from after that, uh, I had an exhibition coming up, and I was having trouble getting this the work for the show made, as E will remember. And uh, I kept on trying stuff, and nothing was working. And then two weeks before. Uh, I made a, I made a, just happened to put down some black paint, dragged with a big brush vertically, and accidentally put a brush sideways. And the brush stroke that went sideways across the black paint looked lighter. So I took an image of a, of a negative portrait of a man, and I, and I used it as the source. And I did vertical lines, vertical breaststrokes, and horizontal breaststrokes. So in the, what you're seeing here is the, is the light areas are just the light shining on the horizontal breaststrokes. Where, where the breaststrokes are vertical, there's no light shining on it. So it, so it, it looked like a great negative, and I thought, oh, that's not bad. I went off into my studio and came back, and came back at a different angle, and it was a positive. That's what it looked like. And all of a sudden it went flip from this to it like that. And I said, OK. Uh, and I did a couple more. And then I got into making just abstract paintings with big brush strokes, swirling, swirling brush strokes. And that, there, here's the first, the first one. And then and if, if you walk around them, the light, cha the light changes as you walk around them. So here's one with three different panels and three different colors on them with silver paint. 
and in this case, and uh, connect connecting things. Whoop, too far. And this one, this is one I began also using, uh, putting the stripes back in, putting the tape down first, and putting or putting color down first, put the tape down, and then silver paint over that, and doing all that kind of stuff. So what I like about it is, is that as it turns. If the, if the person looking at it looks at it from a different angle, there's light and dark, and it's still the same color paint. It's still the same color paint, except that when you move around it, it's parts, the light parts have turned dark, and the dark parts yeah. have turned light. Yeah. They're beautiful. Yeah, thank you. And uh, the next step for me, and I'm kind of going through this chronologically for the most part, uh, was uh, a, a point in my in my uh, career when I thought, okay, I know how to make a painting. Here's the idea, and I start over here, and I go da 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 da. -da, -da. Painting's done. What happens if I, it doesn't? I, as I put it to myself, lots of artists do this all the time. But as I put it to myself, was do I? Does my hand have its own intelligence? If I go up to the canvas and with some, a loaded brush, brush and just start, what happens? What will happen? And just to see, and this this uh, sort of interior shape you see there that looks like a finger being dragged through it, which which it probably was, was this insistent uh, thing that happened over and over and over again every time I went up to it, and uh, it, an interior framing device that argued with the tyranny of the rectangle, and so I I did hundreds of these. They all turned out differently. One thing that I have to point out in here, the back, this background, brown background, looks almost photographic, and that was uh, that's something that led to later work um, that I can talk about. Are but, these all, all also really large paintings? There, uh, this this one is probably six feet tall. Yeah, I think yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of them are small. Some of them are large. Yeah, this one was just layered. Uh, framing devices over and over and over again, stains, and then just the, the center part filled. And here's one that was called Pretty Picture, a cartoony, cartoon frame with all sorts of, again, frame, framing things done over and over again. And the stuff in the center was just, just uh, paint dragged this way, dark uh, white paint, black paint, white paint, black paint, until it, this is what I wound up with. Well, I, years later, I realized that, that this, in this slightly asymmetrical shape that was in the painting came out of this painting, which hung in my family home. My great-grandfather was an antiques, British antiques dealer and watercolorist. This is not one of his uh, paintings, but it was, he brought it over from Britain with him. And uh, I realized this is probably the, the influence from uh, you know that caused this that shape, so I took that that uh, painting, got that painting from home, and brought it here and had a uh, a, a, C, a, a 3D scan made, and then uh, CNCs, which is drilled uh, drilled uh, drilled out uh, wood, and then made um, molds from that, and wound up with these objects like this. They're made of plastic, and uh, they and I made them small, medium, and large, so I could do anything with them and I'd make tons more if I wanted. And then I took this painting, and uh, we can only imagine what the first three letters are there. <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> big, big. Yes, yes. I was I was at, I was actually at the the largest ranch in Alberta, and uh, <clears throat> there's the description. <laughs> and it, and this was a farmer, farmer from a 1952 uh, agricultural magazine. So I took that image and painted them on three of those objects like that. And then moving along still, <laughs> this is a, an oddball painting I made for the, for the uh, as the, as the uh, uh, century turned. Um, it, it was, it's called Elmer Goes for Popcorn. And the background says, the greatest musical ever. Uh, uh, 
and uh, and there actually is no Elmer there. That's not a. That's not where El you see the Elmer. There is nothing there. That's a black wall. So there's just two panels that hang on a black wall. So so I think what's cool about that is is that in order to actually have this painting on your wall, you would have to paint the wall black. I would insist. <laughs> 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 and the other thing that happened with the framing device work is that the, as I did them, the framing devices shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk until they almost formed an object in the center. And then once there was an object in the center, I started doing things like putting polish on them and, and they started to look like sculptures. So in this case, this is the most refined uh, one of those that I did that looks like almost like a realist sculpture, uh, generic modernist sculpture. And, and this one is why I, I think there's a continuity that you don't always think of when you think of your work because if you actually look at this, you can see the person who's looking at the sculpture in the shadow of the piece and only a talented realist painter could actually paint this piece. That's my, mm. my take on it. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> that, this was a fun one to do though, cause, just because I, I think it started off and I, there was just a sense of that figure there and it's just like, just had to get it just right. Yes, yeah. you did. Oh, goodness, what's I want, this? I, I, I really want you to look at this piece carefully because it's very, very important for tonight. This is, this is, how shall I say it? This is an image from a camera obscura. And it's an image from a camera obscura theater. Uh, and a camera obscura, basic, a camera obscura basically means dark room. And if we blocked off all of the light in this room and opened a, an aperture, just whatever size, um, the outside world would appear upside down 180 degrees around the room. So over time I developed, first make, made a camera obscura up at the Banff Center in an office I had. And then I began to think, how can I fool a viewer? So I would do things like uh, put a poster upside down and then project, it would project the right way up onto a wall. And then uh, uh, a still life, turn the still life upside down. And then finally I thought, ah, that old thing, that old thing, remember that? <laughs> And so what I would do, what I did is put, have, have a black turtleneck on and uh, tights over my nose and up here, and then sit in front of a lens that was projected out onto a mylar screen and people would watch. And then I would lip sync to George Jones songs. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, the camera obscure has been a big, a big uh, part of my... And it's fun. It was so much fun, yeah. yeah even though I look serious. Um, here is uh, two paintings. I made one, and it, uh, the image I found came from a Arabic-English dictionary from the 40s or 50s. And I went through the whole book and photographed every image that looked like it came from a, uh, for, for, that was a, had a photographic source rather than being drawn. And so there was this image, and it was called Yawn. And uh, so I made the painting, and I thought, well, he, is he yawning, or is he... Then I, I went, okay, and I made a second one. This one's called Yawner and Singer. They go together. <laughs> and I, I, think, I think this is part of the theme, uh, in many ways, of your work is, is, and if you go back to the framing paintings and some of the, the stripe paintings, you work uh, something until it hits you. And so for this one, as I understand it, in the Arabic dictionary, it was a yawn. And then it struck you, it was something else. Yes, yeah. 
That's why I made the second one. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so then, interestingly enough, the purchaser had to buy two. <laughs> <laughs> and then I began, I showed you that earlier one where there was kind of photographic qualities. So moving ink around, letting nature almost do it. Uh, and there, here's, I did a whole bunch of these uh, works and I still return to them. So for example, on the uh, right hand side, it almost looks like some people on a sled at the bottom one and then the same repeated and then almost like a film strip of people on a sled and then over in the middle one there's uh, almost like Japanese woodcuts is that kind of thing so I was interested in how that these things start to suggest things and I was my interest was if if people if somebody sees a something and they think it's a photograph, then basically it is. They're reading it as a photograph and they're reading it, what's this a photograph of? So I was, I was really fascinated by that as, a, as a, an idea. And in fact, in a lot of your mid to late work, it's, it's the photograph that really does it for you to get you, your juices going. Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. And here's another one. The, the, uh, I was just moving stuff around, moving stuff around, moving stuff around, and there was, uh, I, did a, I had a roller with some ink, or some paint on it, and I rolled up in the upper, upper left hand. I call this, and because it, 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 what it looked like to me was some people sitting there reading, reading in a, in a library. I just call it reading room. So there was the, and it came about because of, because of that. Yeah, well, when you, when you, Without your explanation that it's a painting and has no photograph in it, oftentimes when you see your pieces like this, you're struck that it's in fact uh, a, a bunch of photographic images. That's, it has that suggestion. Yeah. 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 And uh, years ago, I, I met uh, I met William Burroughs at his home in. Lawrence, Kansas, and I, uh, we were talking. He was saying, "Ah, oh, I can't draw a straight line because he also painted." He says, "But when I, what happens is I move when I move paint around, and all of a sudden, if I see an image, I stop." And I thought, "Wow, that's kind of like a kind of photography." Click. As soon as the image appears, the, it's finished. And here's another one, which has some. It's a collage of different types. Of, of work, but there is a there's a strip down right beside the brown that brown side on this side that just when I did it it just looked like chrome and it was just pure happenstance, which is the one of the funnest things about making art for me. Well, it's happenstance, but it's also you deciding when the painting is done. Yeah. And sometimes I think you go back to paintings when you're not sure. Tell us a little bit about how that process works. Yes, well, there was a lot of paintings I did in the, in the 90s that were um, the, the framing device paintings. And, the, and I thought, oh, these are duds. And I had several hundred of them. And I would, some of them worked and some of them, lots of them didn't. And I thought, oh, they're duds. So, you know, 10 years later, all of a sudden I had the thought, they're actually not duds, they're just not finished yet. I can actually take them, put a wash over them, do something to them, and they just start up again. All of a sudden I went from being poor to being rich. <laughs> and then, here are some of the, this is my chorus series, the round ones. There's a few in the, in the halls here. These are, the idea was to make paintings that, um, that these, these portraits, just this much of the face, that are looking over at some, some other art. So I could put them next to somebody else's art and they would appropriate somebody else's art. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, or put them next to my own art. 
and uh, they comment on the like the Greek chorus uh, or like the putti and the, the cherubs in Renaissance painting who are up there. There's some main action going on down here and they're just whispering to each other or paying attention that way. Yeah. So I've done a lot of these and they keep, I keep on going back to them. And this is a show at the Trepania Bear Gallery that were a few years back that had, it was called Candidates and Citizens. And the big paintings are the candidates for whatever, and the, the rest are citizens. And then there's this guy. Well, one of the images I found, I found this guy that looks so snotty, I thought, I'm going to fix him. So what I did is I gave him a, a thought bubbles, and I gave him, uh, I called it brilliant idea, and I had a concrete light bulb made up there. And, and, and this is uh, an act of collaboration, I understand. My son made this, yes. He made the, uh, the, the concrete light bulb down in Oakland. Perfect for my. He did as he was told. <laughs> and another one. This is flat. So it appears to be the corner of a room, like a, a bathroom. She's looking at herself in the mirror, and uh, an oval mirror. And, but it's actually flat. It goes from six feet down to four feet, and then another four by four foot panel. And this is a pa panel from the. Oh, this. How did this get in here? <laughs> we didn't. We, I didn't see this one yesterday, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, this is at the National Gallery. There was, uh, so the, you see my poster there, and there was somebody named Picasso. Uh, 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 I, I, I think he's an Italian artist. Um, um, and here are, what were they called, these guys? The Three Amigos. The Three Amigos on their way to my show. As it turns out, I, I heard about this just as it was happening. And there they are in the show. And there they are. <laughs> now, I, I, have to I have to admit that uh, no, no cameras were allowed in. So I did something with something called um, uh, Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> but this is how many of us feel. <laughs> <laughs> We miss that guy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now here's a painting also in the National Gallery show uh, of the, the frame, one of those frames, and I made a, this uh, line painting of it. And then I had an idea, and I did this to it. I took the painting, or I, I made, a, made a vinyl stencil cut with lines, and I quite a bit larger than the painting, and I laid it on the wall behind the painting, and then put the painting on the wall and trimmed the shadow on the wall to the sh uh, that the painting cast. So the shadow on the wall had stripes in it too. That was a, one of my favorite moments too. And this painting called Blur, um, found image, I blurred it made the, made a, the, the uh, straight lines like that, image out of that. And then I took, had a show in Toronto at my gallery called Clint Ronish Gallery. And uh, I put 24 paintings exactly the same all the way around the room. So that's actually, it's, it's not 24 pieces, it's one piece. And uh, so it's, you're surrounded by it, it's always the same. Uh, it's a beautiful image. You walk towards it, it dissolves into, into stripes. And a very complex painting. This is a, uh, a yearbook from way back 
found your book, and I just I've I talked with it. I've laid made layers of advertising on it, and it's just uh, it's just you can get lost in it. And it's actually it's hard to see here, but it's got iridescent color through it. And if you if you kind of lean down a bit, all of a sudden it turns into rainbows behind it. And this one, a portrait, large portrait, about four feet tall, and it's made on a mirror. So it's blasted from the back and paint the paint put on. And here's the image of Kevin Bayer at Trevany Bear, uh, reflected in the mirror as well. And this, the last image, is my last. Uh, sh the last show I just had at Trepania Bear Gallery of a whole series of these drawings which are quite abstract. Some of them are, you get up close to them and you can't even, can hardly tell what you're looking at. So Chris, that's a wonderful um, and I would say far too quick review of your work. I know others of you are uh, going to stay because Chris could go on and on and on. And on. Uh, <laughs> uh, my wife expressed some concern that if Chris liked to talk and he was talking to me, we were, you were all finished. <laughs> it, it's, it's, been a, it's been a complete pleasure. I want to remind you that Chris's, some of Chris's work is actually on the walls in this space. And I'd invite you to go and I'd invite you to walk around it so that uh, you can see in the physical presence rather than the digital presence, uh, the, the fine work and to also understand um, how uh, Chris manipulates images in such a way that you're not always seeing what you think you're seeing. And that's part of the magic of Chris Cran. I'd ask that you uh, join me in uh, thanking Chris for a wonderful review of his work. Thank you. Thank you. That's great.